So this episode of the iMore Show is brought to you today by lynda.com, the online learning platform with over 3,000 on-demand videos to help you strengthen your business, technology, and creative skills. For a free 10-day trial, visit lynda.com slash iMore. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash iMore. Thanks, Linda. Yay, Linda. Hey everyone, it is March 4, 2015. I'm Renee Ritchie, and right now we're going to talk all about Apple's upcoming Spring Forward event, the Apple Watch, and everything else that's happening in this universe and several others. This is the iMore Show. Joining me this week, we have a brief appearance from Peter Cohen, who has an appointment but didn't want to miss out on saying hi to everybody. How's it going, Peter? I am doing well, thank you very much. So we have you for about 15 minutes, you said? That's right, yeah. All right, so we'll make good use of you. Also joining us, we have Trinity Caldwell. How are you, Ren? I'm doing all right. You guys are snowed in still, right? Frozen rain, everything? Yeah, we're froze. We're froze. We're frozen. Frozen in. Frozen. And joining us from uh, the land of abandoned snow, the man who's been laughing at me going on three, four months now, Jim Dalrymple. How are you, Jim? I'm doing good. How are you? Good. Editor-in-chief of The Loop, uh, publisher of The Loop magazine. How is everything in The Loop first? Uh, everything is great. Couldn't be better. Yeah, I was telling Jim my favorite thing about The Loop is when I go there and I look at the slugs on his posts and it's like F and Samsung dash six. <laughs> <laughs> the best. <laughs> yeah, they're, 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 I, I, was, I was getting kind of upset yesterday between Samsung and, and, and Kanye. <laughs> it just, the two of them just drive me nuts. I woke up in a good mood yesterday. I went to bed pretty angry. So if Kanye did a Samsung commercial, that would just that would just be the worst for you. Oh, I I I, I just close my computer and and leave for the day. Yeah, you said at one point you promised to go around and actually take people's keyboards away, and you never had to, you got distracted by goldfish crackers or something. I yeah, I love goldfish crackers. Yesterday was actually a pretty bad day because um, a, there was a guy who did a blog post saying that uh, banks are being social. There's a social engineering attack against banks that's causing them to approve credit cards that are fraudulent or the are the product of identity theft, and people are then using them in Apple Pay and they put very small at the bottom and other similar transaction systems from other vendors like Google, blah blah blah. Yeah. But the headline on the Wall Street Journal, the headline in the Guardian, the headline on all these other mainstream outlets was Apple Pay fraud. Yeah. And there is one. No, if you actually read it, Apple Pay is so secure that the only way they can attack it is with a traditional social engineering attack against the banks. Uh, and to make it worse, Apple provides a ton of information to banks. They give you the last four numbers of the credit card, the iTunes account information, the phone number, and various other elements that it, they, they transmit them securely. And it's not a privacy violation because that's the bank information. It's a credit card you have assigned to them with the bank. So the bank can make sure it's actually you. And then they have a green path if everything checks out, and they have a yellow path if there's any suspicion at all. And the bank can call you and have you enter a text message that they send you. There's all sorts of things, and the banks are just not doing a good job of preventing fraud. But bad apple. Yeah, and that's it's... that's nothing new. You know, bank. That's what banks do. They, it's like they want fraud. So, everyone, you were gonna say. I'm just shaking my head at the whole thing. It just, it seems ridiculous to me um, in part because it's like, all right, we've got to drum up a sensational story against Apple Pay. Something must be wrong with it. Oh, let's use this vulnerability that really has very little to do with Apple itself. But hey, it's connected to Apple Pay so we can use it in the headline to get more clicks. We got a bunch of tweets from Eric on Twitter who uses Eric Analytics as his Twitter name. And he was saying he checked with uh, security departments at banks, and there was nothing unusual about the fraud levels with Apple Pay at all. And uh, he remarked too, which I, I forgot to even look into, is that all of these articles were single sourced. Charles Arthur from The Guardian at least asked the Wall Street Journal, you know, why did you include the figure that it was 60 times more? I looked into it, I couldn't find a second source, so I didn't include it. But, you know, that makes Apple look bad. Yeah, especially coming from The Journal, uh, who should know better. And you know should have double or triple sources at least. But Peter, no, my, leave it to the bloggers. 
Yeah, you're exactly right. And the mainstream people, mainstream press often makes fun of us or derides us. So when they link to our site, says something, you know, sort of patronizing about the sort the, the sites that they're linking to. By Apple the way, again, site imore.com. Exactly. That, but see, Peter, so my worry, though, is that like muggles, as you call them, or civilians, whatever word you want to use, people should be empowered by technology. They should not be made afraid of it. And my worry with these things is that an attempt to be sensational and to drive whatever they were trying to drive to get attention, they're actually taking people, they're, they're making people more afraid of technology. Technology. And things like Apple Pay are incredibly inclusive. It lets people with accessibility issues and with other issues make payments in an easier way, and they're the people who get hurt by this. Well, what, what we have to remember is that, you know, us and the people that are, are listening and watching this show, you know, we know better. And when, when I post something like this, uh, oftentimes people will say, well, you know, why did you bother posting that? Because we all know it's not true. But the fact is, 90% of the population doesn't know it's not true because they don't follow uh, technology the way that we all do. So, you know, they, they believe the Wall Street Journal. And if they say that there's a problem, then they think that there's a problem. And how many times do you go to a coffee shop or, you know, you're talking to a friend that isn't into technology and they say, oh, yeah, I heard about that uh, Apple Pay debacle, you know, where everybody's stealing credit cards. Yeah, no. Well, I can guarantee you when I go to the store this weekend, a customer is going to bring it up at some point or another. You know, how about that Apple Pay? I heard Apple Pay got hacked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, just, because... Just punch him in the face. That, that's what I usually do. And surprisingly, I haven't gotten fired yet. I'm kind of waiting for it. But, you know, we'll see what happens. But seriously, you know... It, it, the, the the problem here is that um, people don't treat what they read with um, any kind of critical eye. You know, the, the people just take um, as credulous uh, information that they're getting from whatever news source they, they want to get it from, whether it's the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times, the Boston Globe, um, you know, a magazine, a, 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 a uh, another website, whatever. Uh, you know, of course, it's incumbent upon all of us who report on the technology news that we report on uh, to do it accurately and, um, uh, you know, to, to not jump to conclusions that, that, that haven't been borne out with evidence. But, um, you know, it's, this, is, this is an ongoing problem. This is nothing new. You know, the idea of yellow journalism has been around, you know, for 100 years or more. Yeah. Um, so, the, to, to, to be frank, I don't really think that there's a lot that you can do, you know, it, it, uh, outside of you take publications like Wall Street Journal to task when they report it wrong and make sure that the, the correct news gets out there. One of the bigger problems is, is the stories themselves were actually pretty good, but the headline slapped on top of them, whether it be most likely by an editor at some point along the chain, was just absolutely not representative of even the story that they, that they themselves had written. And some people get upset and say that we're defending Apple and, oh, you're just protecting Apple. There was a vulnerability in Safari today, and I asked Apple about it, and they said, yeah, we're, we're going to fix it next week. When you ask them about Apple Pay, they're like, there's nothing wrong with this. Here's everything that we've put online, all the procedures we have in place. All people have to do is implement it. And I, I don't think of it as defending Apple. I think of it as defending my mom because, as I've said before, she watches the BBC. They'll say something like this, and she will call me worried about Apple Pay or someone spying on her iPhone and it's it's the normal people I worry about, Ren. I feel like it's it's our job not to defend Apple, but to defend the people using that technology. Absolutely. If if it's a if it's a misleading headline or a story that my mother is going to get confused over, you're you know you're damn right that I'm going to write something about it because I just I feel like the the need for uh, journalists to publish Apple-based stories has gotten so crazy that occasionally. <laughs> Everybody writes stuff that you know, maybe not not quite correct, not quite a uh, not quite on the level, um, whether intentionally or unintentionally. And it's one of those things where I just can't, like, I can't sit by and and have five of my friends being like, oh hey, you got the, the iPhone six, so has it bent yet? You know, yeah. has your has your Apple Pay uh, has your Apple Pay sent all of your your money to to evil you know evil hackers? That's just it's fud. Basically, yeah. Jim and I were having a beer when we saw the story about Canadian iPhones, <laughs> and we we both did an impromptu test, and the Canadian iPhones are the same as every other iPhone. 
<laughs> the stuff is just crazy. Yeah, you know, a, a long time ago, I used to write for martial arts magazines, and a couple times the editor would say, can you fit Bruce Lee in the story? Because if you fit Bruce Lee and we can put him on the cover, and anytime you put Bruce Lee on the cover, we sell 10 to 100 times more magazines because that's what people want. That's what sells. And now Apple is what people want in technology. Uh, and if you can put Apple on the cover, uh, especially if you can put them in a way that makes people panic or in other way engages a very primal response in them, you get much more attention than you get otherwise. And I, I'm going to see how many different ways I can fit Bruce Lee into headlines on iMore.com. <laughs> I think more often than you probably suspect. Do it, Peter. I Do it. He may not be past his prime yet. Anyway, yeah, so uh, there's no problem with Apple Pay. There is a problem with banks. Banks need to fix it. There is a freak attack, which uh, is targeting both the Safari browser and a ton of very popular websites. And Apple, Google's already patched it. If you start, if you stop Chrome and restart it, it'll be patched. Apple's patching it next week in iOS and OS 10. Um, so just be be aware of that. And you can find information about it at freakattack.com or wherever fine virus warnings are made available. So we're going to take a quick break, and we're going to talk about PDF Pen, the ultimate all-purpose PDF editor. Um, I love PDF Pen, Ren. It's just awesome. It's pretty cool. It just allows you to get through forms so quickly that you would otherwise have to just manually be like, all right, click, click, sign, click, click, sign. I just, and I like that you can have it both on iOS and on your Mac. Yeah, I don't even know if this spot is for the iOS or Mac version, so I'm just going to talk about them both because on the Mac, it's really cool. Like Whenever I have to fill out one of those awful government forms, I just open it up in PDF pen, and it works so well that it actually makes the government less tedious. I, I can't think of a stronger endorsement than that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really rad. So if you're not familiar with it, like everyone knows PDF, PDF, the portable document format from Adobe, our friends at Adobe, that lets you basically print pages into files that you can then transfer around. But they were never designed for half the things that we use them for because now we want them to be interactive and dynamic and all these things. And what PDF pen does is instead of you having to print these things out, get a pen and mark them up like an animal, you can just do all this on your computer like a human being, save it and then send it right back. No fax machines are involved. This to me is, is computer magic, Ren. I absolutely agree. Uh, the, the, so the, I'm interested in how you do on the iOS, because on iOS it used to be kind of tedious, but now that we have iOS 8 and extensibility and all these things, I just launch the app, like I, I open the PDF in mail, I launch the app from open in, I do what I need to do, and then I just go right into the share sheet. It's just- Let's Pop uh, it right back out, yeah. It's, it's dynamic, it's fluid, it just works. Um, you can apply markup to a PDF, add a signature to a PDF, fill in PDF forms, touch up images in PDF. You can use iCloud, Dropbox, you can sync PDFs. It syncs with PDF Pen for iPad and iPhone and the Mac if you, know, if you have all, all the versions. You can perform OCR on the Mac to convert scanned documents into usable text. You can correct, you can redact. Uh, there's just so many things. The PDF Pen on the it is for PDF Pen on the Mac. I found this now. PDF Pen 7 and PDF Pen Pro 7 require Yosemite OS 10.10. Uh, new things include updated Yosemite interface. You can proof OCR text from scanned pages. There's context-sensitive pop-up menus. You can load and save performance. There's sorry, performance boosts for loading and saving. Compatibility with I. It's just the. You should have just bought it. By the time I read this list to you, you should have just bought it and maybe gifted a few copies to your friends and relatives. Yep. So for more information on these, you can just go to smilesoftware.com. Uh, I, I would just recommend going straight to the App Store. It's nice if you go to Smile first. We'll put a link in the show notes so that you, you can tell them that you heard about it here, and that's great for us. But seriously, this software is great for you, so j just go get it. You'll be happy you did. I agree. <laughs> Thank you, Smile. Jim, Apple sent out an invitation to an event in San Francisco on the 9th. Yay. You gonna go? I am gonna go. So what do you think? Spring forward. Is that telling us that the event's gonna be in the spring? Uh, no. I think that it's very clear that spring forward means spring. Spring, there's uh, springs in a car and cars move forward. So it's going to be a car. The <laughs> Apple car. Yeah, it has to be. What else could it be? Spring forward. I mean, the car actually has four springs. <laughs> so this is more obvious than what, what everybody, everybody Spring thinks. Spring forward. So are you officially right. noping the Apple slinky rumors, Jim? Is that what this is? Uh, you know, I, I just hold on. Tim's talking to me. What? <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, you know, I, I think it's going to be an interesting event. Um, we're we're going to learn more about the Apple Watch. And there's still so much that we don't know. I mean, there's a lot that, that we're speculating on, and a lot that we're guessing on. We don't know prices. We don't know all the features that are going to be there. So, you know, you see these articles where, oh, Apple Watch is going to be a flop. Well, how, how can you say that? And on the same hand, you can't say that... Um, Apple Watch is going to be a, a massive uh, success. You just can't because there's no way to know. We don't know how people are going to react to it. We know how techies like us will react to it. We'll try it. We'll buy it. We'll do reviews. But it's going to take some time to see how we actually use it. And that's going to be the test. I mean, I haven't worn a watch since 2006. Yeah, I'm right in the same boat as Jim. You know, I haven't worn a watch since I started using a PowerBook uh, full time. Uh, you know, I was wearing a watch and and had my PowerBook, and then I noticed that I was scratching up the uh, uh, the trackpad area, and I stopped wearing it. And shortly thereafter, I got a cell phone, so I really didn't have any reason to wear a watch anymore. So, you know, that that's why I've been skeptical all along that I'm really going to be that interested in having an Apple Watch. But if it can do a lot of other things, and and uh, can make my life better. I'm certainly open to it, but uh, I'm still worried about scratching up my laptop. Yeah, you know, I was actually kind of thinking about that um, when I was working on my MacBook Air the other day on my couch. I'm, I, I'm trying to, you know, feel out, oh, what, what, what wearing a watch feel like after, you know, spending so many years not doing so. And I'm like, man, I'm just going to be constantly like scritch, scritch, scritch as I'm trying to type, aren't I? Like, this is this is going to be a problem. <laughs> I had that with my Pebble. I, when I was wearing the Pebble for a while, it would knock up against the the keyboard. But I'm figuring that one of those bands will just be optimized for typing. Apple knows this. They've been wearing it. Tim Cook has been typing on things, using his iPad too, of course, but you know, typing on things. And they'll have one of those silicon bands will be optimized for MacBook, you know, saving. Johnny you know. Ive has a solution somewhere. I'm sure. I don't think so. No. <laughs> no. You're not a band optimist, Jim. No, I think you've all been smoking some funny stuff. <laughs> so one of the things that was interesting to me is that Apple hasn't done a spring event in a couple of years. The last one, I think, was the iPad 3 event where they also announced the Apple TV 1080p. And for a couple of years, people were getting, you know, I don't know what that word is, stressed that Apple wasn't announcing things every spring anymore. We'd have They're to not wait. innovating. Oh, no, my yeah. God. Apple's doing. We're waiting until June before they announce a single product. Uh, but this year, there's like there's the watch on deck, obviously. Um, people have been talking for a while about a MacBook Air refresh. The Apple TV hasn't been updated since that last spring event. Uh, there's rumors of Apple pens, of, of bigger iPad. It, Jim, it sounds like we're, we're back in the place where there's more Apple products than we can comfortably fit in our speculation. Well, I, I, if you look at, at somebody that says, you know, well, Apple is, is not innovating anymore, um, just ask them when, when the last uh, Dell computer was released. What, what was the date of that event again? <laughs> you know, I, people, and Serenity was right. People need to write something about Apple. That's what it is. And, you know, we all talk to the editors of, of these newspapers and magazines, and they're, uh, or the writers, and their editors are telling them, go find an Apple story. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to, to push up... Uh, pages and we need some more interest in the sites and that's what they do they tell them to go write an apple story because that will will create everything that they need and that's awful it'll magically fix all of our traffic woes yes yeah, it's, it's ridiculous because there are like there are plenty of interesting things to currently write about in the apple sphere that don't rely on abject speculation you know we can talk about how much money apple's making and what they're doing for the environment we can talk about the computers that are currently out we can talk about the photos for mac beta that's coming and all of the all of the potential that that has whether good or bad to to help people organize your photos we can talk about what we already know about the apple watch but but do we want to talk about that? No, we want to talk about cars. We want to talk about cars that are five years away if they exist at all. We want to talk about um, hypothetical stylus pens and whether or not they're going to change the course of iPad's history. We want to talk about how the iPad is doomed, despite the fact that the data doesn't necessarily reflect that. 
when you actually analyze See, it. See, you're just being too reasonable. Rennie, how do you put up with this? I, I don't know. But <laughs> it raises an interesting point. You mentioned this earlier too, Jim, is like the, there, there are articles saying the Apple Watch is going to be a flop. There were articles that said the Mac was going to be a flop. No one would use anything called a mouse. There were articles saying the iPhone would be a flop. The iPad would be a flop. Everything Apple's ever, ever introduced has been preceded by it's going to be a flop. But it, it's interesting to me like how we measure success as well. Uh, Android Wear has been on the market for six months. People wrote articles saying it's not as successful as the iPhone. The iPhone's the most successful product in history. It's more successful than legal products. Sorry, it's more successful than you know gasoline lately, which is pretty which is pretty successful. Uh, what I, I, even if the like the iPad has been called doomed when companies would kill to have a business that big. Yeah. I don't know how you measure the I, I, Apple Watch success in Apple terms. Well, I, I think that um, what's going on with with the iPad is that a lot of people, analysts, um, business people, expected the turnaround and cycle of the iPad to be similar to the iPhone, and it's not. The iPad is more like a computer than uh, a phone, and that cycle just doesn't jump. But last quarter, they sold 24 and a half million. I mean, come on. You compare that to PCs, that's, that's a lot of computers. I would yeah. like that business. Yeah, that might you not know, be a... <laughs> I'm, I'm going to throw it out there for Tim. I will take 1% of, of the, the iPhone business, and I'll be very happy. And, and as you know, a return for him, he can use my likeness on all advertising for, uh, for the iPhone. <laughs> Special <laughs> Heineken-branded iPhone. If you need to pause or take a call, Jim, just let us know. <laughs> Get that deal done. <laughs> No, but I think that's absolutely right. I think the Apple Watch, I have no idea how much it'll sell. I think it'll end up being somewhere between the Apple TV and the iPad because, you know, everyone everyone believes, almost everyone believes they need a phone. Most people still believe they need a computer. We've seen with the iPad that, you know, a, a lot of people need it. Some people aren't sure. And when they buy one, they stick with it for a long time. The Apple Watch, I think, initially at least, people won't be so sure about it. And they might approach it trepidatiously or they might wait. There'll be a lot of people who do jump on it, but I think somewhere between the millions and millions of Apple TV sold and the tens of millions of iPads sold, that would still be a very successful, it would be the most successful smartwatch launch ever. Yeah. So I, would you buy, are you going to buy an Apple Watch? I am going to buy an Apple Watch. Uh, Why? Not, uh, particularly because I feel like I have become one of these people who constantly pulls the phone out to try and do one thing and then ends up with five other things um, okay. five minutes later. Um, and so in part, I think that the way that the watch is handling notifications will be much more friendly to my lifestyle and make my boyfriend and my friends less likely to throw me out a window. Um, but honestly, like there, there are a lot of things that appeal to me and I actually wrote an article, uh, this week on it where it's just, um, I think that there's a lot of individual little, little things like the health tracking I think is really uh, really interesting to me. I had a, um, a step counter. I had a Fitbit for a while, but I, you know, I play roller derby and step counting doesn't really help when you're on wheels. Yeah. Uh, so being able to, you know, like track your heart rate and track your cardio and things like that with, with the, with the sensors that it has embedded, like that's a lot more interesting to me. Um, and the fact that, you know, you can, you can pull a lot of data that you can use Apple pay with it. They're just, a, again, a lot of, a lot of little things for me that I think build up and that's, and we haven't even gotten into the app sphere and what third party app developers will do with it. So it's like, I, I don't necessarily know if the watch will be for everybody, but I do feel like there are lots of compelling individual use cases for for people to integrate it into their lives. At, at the end of the day, I think it just depends on how much technology you like to have in your life um, and also how good Siri is going to be on the watch. I feel like that could, that could potentially be a huge selling point um, or a great disaster. I agree. Uh, from what I've seen, though, um, Siri is very good. So that's a, that's a big plus. Yeah. I mean, it's been getting better and better and, and no doubt, like I've still had ridiculous, uh, Siri mistranscriptions while driving in the car. 
Um, but I, I do think that there is something you're going to be, there's going to be something very charming to being able to, you know, pull up secret agent style and be like, mm -hmm. Hey Siri, you know, get me a reservation at this table at 7 PM or Hey Siri, you know, what's, what is the biggest moon of Saturn? Um, Hey Siri, reply to Ricky, tell him I'm going to be five minutes late. You know, like if those if those work as flawlessly and as seamlessly as Apple would like them to, um, that takes away so much stress on the iPhone. Like but with with the iPhone, you have the digital keyboard, right? You have the virtual keyboard and I like as cool as dictation and theory are, I find myself sometimes just using the keyboard because that's what we're used to. You're like, oh, well, I can type quickly and Siri may be faster, but if it goofs up, then I'll just be in a, you know, between right. a rock and a hard place. With the watch, it's kind of like, well, I either dictate it or I have to pull out my phone. And I think that extra gesture is actually what's going to you know, what's going to cement the watch a little bit as like, oh, yeah, I can use Siri to dictate my message and 99 times out of 10, it's not a problem. Looking at, at what's come out so far in the whole smartwatch category, what what's always gotten me is that I don't see how it's going to be more useful than just taking my phone and doing it, you know, and it's similar to what you're saying. Is it going to be if Siri screws up, then I might as well just take my phone. Mm -hmm. You know, and just go ahead and do and do those other five things and whatever, you know. Um, but if if the watch can can actually do some things, I mean, the whole health bit. I mean, in the past six eight months, I've lost thirty five pounds. I, I've been you know walking and feeling a lot better. And the lack of snow. <laughs> it's like it is the total lack of snow. Mm -hmm. uh, I I love Health Kit because it can tell me. Um, how many steps I, I've taken, how far I've gone that day. And that's not just with the walk. That's, you know, you'd be surprised how much you walk in the run of a day just going to the grocery store and doing all these different things. Um, you know, you are getting some exercise, and I, that makes me feel good. You know, when I see stuff like that, I, I, I'm always happy that, wow, I've gone, you know, like three miles today. Um, so I, I think that'll be a good thing. I feel so much the same way as Serenity. There's just so many things where I pull my phone out for a couple of seconds and put it back or I have to reach into a bag and get it or go across the room and get it off my desk. Even something as quick as, you know, like I'm, I'm supposed to meet Jim and I'm running five minutes late and I just, the phone rings, I tap it, I say, Jim, I'll be there in five. He says, okay, and hangs up. I never have to reach for my phone. I never have to do these things. But you know when that happens, that's going to cost you an extra case of Heineken. <laughs> it's every time. I mean, it, every no, minute. It's just, it's, it's those millions of things that are incredibly important urgent even but don't take a lot of time and and I know it sounds stupid like what, what's the big deal about reaching for your iPhone but just over and over again if I can offset those to my watch and like Trinity says have more focus so that I'm on there and I'm like I might as well just twi check Twitter or Facebook while right. I'm doing this oh and my it, god that's painful it is and or, oh. I, I even my lights my lights are all these hue light bulbs behind me and now they have a widget which is faster but before it was pull out my watch my, my phone unlock it swipe over open the folder open the app go to the right tab turn on the right light turn it off the right light if it's on my watch it's just either I tell Siri turn off the lights or I just tap you know the the app on the watch I don't have to do all that all that quote unquote work but it it does add up it it's the same way the phone can't do as much as the Mac but is much more convenient than the Mac I think the watch is going to be much more convenient than the phone for some things so what about things like uh, Bluetooth audio is this going to be a big boon for uh, Bluetooth audio headphones you're the music uh, guy Jim <laughs> well, I, yeah I uh... I did buy a pair of Bluetooth uh, Bluetooth headphones in the last week um, in theoretically for uh, for pregame warm up so that I didn't have to carry my phone out and about on the track. Uh, but I'm actually really interested to see a we haven't really heard a lot about how the watch is going to deal with music or how much onboard storage it has, because obviously when you depair it from the phone, it can't really rely on uh, wireless connection to stream. Uh, so, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of interested in how that shakes out and just to, like, is it going to be an iPod shuffle kind of thing? Uh, but I do, like, I wonder if Apple is actually going to, we, we might see um, Apple Bluetooth headphone accessories. Because uh, it's like, that's that's something that they have yet to go into. And Beats has a set of wireless headphones, but I think they're like 200 bucks or something crazy like that. 
I was thinking that the, it's not going to really matter with the watch because the, the Bluetooth will still go to the phone because your watch is still paired to the phone. So, you know, the phone is just a conduit. So, mm -hmm. you know, it'll probably, uh, the, the sound itself will probably still go through the phone into Bluetooth headsets. But I'm wondering if people will. Unless you're well, jogging, actually, right, Jim? If, if you just take the watch with you jogging, it might have to go directly to the I, I have I have no idea about jogging. <laughs> walking. If you're That's, out walking yeah. with just your watch. Jogging's not a real word. <laughs> you know what I'm actually really excited, speaking of walking um, and the Apple Watch, is the contextual notifications and the tap buzzing. Um, it, I'm, they, uh, they pitched at the September event the idea of having a different tap for directions to have you go left or go right. Um, and I really like that idea, especially as someone, you know, I live in a city uh, that's fairly walkable, um, but Boston, as anybody who's ever visited here uh, might well know, is a series of crazy one-way streets that don't exactly follow a direct grid. Um, so the first couple months that I lived here, and indeed pretty much any time when I'm exploring outside of my, you know, two-mile home radius, I constantly have my phone out being like, all right, I'm not going to wander into a ditch here, right? This is the right one-way street. I'm not, you know, flying blind. Um, and I, you know, as even as like a fairly tech savvy traveler, I still feel very self-conscious being like, OK, I got to check the phone really subtly so that people don't think I'm like tourist. Very easy mark. <laughs> um, in, and in contrast, it's like, all right, if I'm going to, you know, if I if I'm wearing the watch, I never have to take my phone out of my pocket. And in theory, I never even have to look at the watch. It's just going to buzz when I need to turn. And then occasionally I might, you know, pull it up for a short look and I can see and make sure that I am still on the right street. Uh, but otherwise, like not not having to stress out about directions or seeing that overall picture, or worrying that I've missed my turn, um, especially something like biking, too. Like if you don't have a bike mount for your smartphone um, and you want to be able to like tell where you're going, I can imagine a watch being infinitely more useful for that than uh, than trying to like mount a, a six or even imagine mounting a six plus on a bike. It's like having a GPS head unit. It's, it's like crazy. having a giant clock around your neck or a boombox. Yeah, exactly. Shoulder. It's crazy. So 80s. It's crazy. Curtis Boyle in the chat room is saying that I think the watch will be similar to the original iPhone. The first version will do well, but the second will do better once full native apps come out. And you could argue that was true with the iPad too, that it really found its stride with the second version. But here's what I'm thinking. Like it's, it, it is tempting to wait for a second generation, but let's say you just get the $3, the $250 iWatch, uh, um, Apple Watch. Did you just like, announce a $3 iWatch? $350. Yeah. Spoiler. $3 American, $350 Canadian. Um, let's say you just get that. I, I'm going to get an Apple Watch for a year longer than if I waited till the second generation. And for a dollar a day, I spend so much money on such stupid things every day that a dollar to have a watch, you know, for an extra day is fine for me. I'll, you know, I, I'll get the second generation that comes out, but I don't want to wait another year for it. Yeah. Yeah. And I am well, still, go ahead, Jim. Sorry. No, I am I am still curious also, you know, we talked a little bit about watch edition pricing and just how the upgrade cycle is going to look for um for the Apple Watch, whether it's going to be a device that like the iPhone um and iPad gets upgraded every 12 months or whether there might be more incremental update upgrades or whether the Sport gets upgraded every year but the edition maybe has removable internals, like there's there's so much unknowns there that we really we really can't um, pinpoint until we hear more about how the watch is functioning. Yeah, Jim mentioned that earlier that there are still, I mean, Apple announced a lot of stuff at the event, but a lot of the fine details we still don't know, including the pricing of the other versions above the baseline, 350, uh, whether bands are compatible across Band collections. <laughs> yeah, across collections. Like, can you can you get a sport and then put a link bracelet on it? You can you, or a red band. There's there's so many things that we don't know yet. How they're going to be serviced? How they're going to be sold? Uh, I asked this last week, Jim, but I'm interested in your point of view. Do you, as a journalist or as someone just interested in the Apple Watch, would you like to hear Apple's plans for how they're going to sell it at the event, or is that of less interest to you than the actual product itself? You know, I. I think it is going to be interesting to see how they sell it. And, you know, it's something that I think that they'll make us aware of because, you know, it's going to be out there very soon. But, you know, you have this whole fashion side of things and then you have, you know, I can't imagine you're going to be able to walk into an Apple retail store and buy a gold edition watch. 
I, I just I can't see that, especially when you look at how they previewed the watch in Paris. Who was at a boutique? You know, so is that going to be uh, a boutique fashion thing, and that's the only place you can get it? I mean, are they going to send out you know a ten or twenty thousand dollar watch over FedEx, and you know you just put it on your credit card? I mean, you know, we. Renny, we all don't have your money. We can't just put a twenty thousand dollar watch on a credit card. I'm not getting. I know people who are getting, it, and I believe that that you actually get a small human for the price of the watch, and they hand deliver it to you. It's 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 a butler service that comes with the watch, like like Virtu phones. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, you know, I, actually, that was something I was just googling while you were chatting, uh, Jim, on whether I'm like, does Rolex sell? watches online like is that a thing i mean i know you probably get it on ebay but no but it, it really does look like certain certain high-end luxury items can only be bought in stores so it may just be that like the, the edition is an in-store product and very much an in-store you know you you get to try it on you get to have the experience uh whether i do think that that experience will happen in an apple store but it may be i don't necessarily think it'll be a backroom thing but it may be a little bit more uh Middle, a little bit more in depth. I know last week we were talking a little bit about, oh, well, maybe it's a reservation program. Maybe you come in and you're like, I've made an appointment for my gold apple watch. <laughs> oh, you got to do a fake British accent. With I have, I'm here for my appointment for the Apple Watch. Yes, exactly. You get, you get a little Apple specialist following you around, being like, Madame, do you want these bracelets? Or it's these like going ones? into Gringotts. Yeah, see, exactly. that wouldn't happen to me. I'd just go and say, "Yeah, I'm here for my gold Apple Watch," and they would arrest me and throw <laughs> me. Well, so that's my other question, Jim, because uh, you know, some people seem almost offended that Apple is making a gold watch, that it's not Apple, that Apple is affordable luxury. It sort of struck me that Apple having a gold watch does a lot of good things for them. First, it gets them involved in conversations about Apple having a gold watch, and you know, no one cared about Mobile World Congress. Everyone was talking about how much the gold watch was going to cost. Yeah. But also, it gets uh, Vogue has been putting on the cover. It's been at those boutiques you mentioned. There, there are people who just want gold watches, and if they want an Apple watch, and they like gold watches, and they have enough money to buy the beautiful province of Nova Scotia, what do they care? What is Apple? Yeah. What <laughs> well, Apple has always been a fashion company. I mean, if you look back as, as far as the Mac, I mean, it was a fashionable item. And, and most of the products that they had, even when the, the company sucked, they always tried to, to make uh, fashionable items and not all the CEOs did as well but from when Steve came back uh, to today everything is fashionable in one way or another now they just have a higher end item that they're going to be able to, to put out at you know these boutiques I mean imagine a boutique uh, on Rodeo Drive you you go in you have uh, you know your your fashion planner or whatever that person may be going around and picking out stuff with you. Oh, and here's an Apple watch that you can put on. It's only 20,000, you know, which is nothing really. Um, to that market. No, to that market. So I can see them being in, in those types of stores where, you know, those people would come in and, and it's a, a, an experience to shop, but that's what they're used to. You know, those are the ones with the big burly guards at the door. You know, where you can't even look inside. And the hyenas on chains. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, because when we were at Las Vegas, you know, every time we go to CES, you walk through the Wynn. I don't know if it's actually the Wynn. It's one of the hotels. And there's the Virtu store where you can go in there and previously get Symbian phones, now Android phones that are encrusted in gold and jewels. And there's Porsche Design. Uh, fellow Canadian Kevin Mitchelluck bought a BlackBerry, a, a Porsche Design BlackBerry last year at CES for $1,000. The $600 back that went with it, and I think another $500 case that went on it. And these are these are sold in Abu Dhabi, and they're sold around the world in luxury shops. And nobody no, nobody writes nasty articles saying, you know, these companies, Android and BlackBerry, have lost the, lost their common touch. Well, I, I think that that's because most people are surprised that BlackBerry's still in business. They're a national treasure, Jim Dalrymple. <laughs> So are we. Like, like Molson. Yes, absolutely. True. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I think that's absolutely true. And I think it's 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 really interesting to see Apple dabble. And, and you know, you, no one has to buy a gold Apple watch. You can actually pretend it doesn't exist. But I think it's interesting that there are these different markets for watches. There are people who are really passionate about sport watches and timers and lap keepers and all these things. And there are people who are passionate about 
uh, chronographs and there are people who are passionate about gold watches and the Apple Watch is going to serve all these different audiences and it's going to do it right away. It's not like Apple's making one watch and then a few years later making other versions the way they have with iOS devices. And I think that's maybe because both, you know, Apple's a little more confident. You have Johnny Ive and Mark Newsom, but also watches are a really established industry as much as it's, it's almost like, I said this in my article, it's almost the inverse. Um, the phones had to be made People had to sort of get accustomed to having a smartphone, but people are accustomed to watches. Apple just needs to tell them the benefits of them being smart. It's a different, it's a different sort of a sales pitch. Well, and I think we've been, a lot of people I think feel like they've been had with a lot of the, the tech products that have been out there. Oh, this is smart. You know, it's going to do all these wonderful things. And it doesn't. Um, I don't know. I, I, I hope Apple can help educate people better on what these can do. I was kind of looking at the watch faces and all the different uh, complications that they have. And you can get like your appointments will just show up there and the sunrise and sunset and faces of them. Some of that stuff I want on my iPhone lock screen. I mean, just the ability to glance down and see all that. I'm, I'm going to send my heartbeat to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> it's not creepy at all. Jim Novelis <laughs> thinking of you. <laughs> What would be funnier is if, if, if the heart only beat once every two or three minutes. <laughs> Hibernating. Yes. <laughs> Hibernating in the California sun. Be back soon. <laughs> so, uh, Jim, is it interesting to you that the event, I mean, Tim Cook previously said that the Apple Watch will be out in April. Is it interesting to you at all that the event is so early in March? Because we've, we've gotten used to Apple coming out and saying the iPod or the Mac is available today. The iPhone is available in 10 days. Now we have what looks to be a, a larger gap uh, in between an event and a release. No, I, you know, Apple schedules these events uh, uh, and, and they'll mark the time that, uh, that the watch is coming out. I, I don't read anything into the timing of the event as, as opposed to when the watch is coming out. And the watch date for them will be fixed on March the 9th. This is the day it's coming out. You know, that could be towards the end of April. It could be the first of April, in which case, you know, we're only a couple weeks away. So I, I don't read anything special into that. I kind of hope, and I said this before, I, I kind of hope they take their time because if, if Tim Cook says April, to me, April 30th is a great day because it means Apple's had another extra solid month of making that watch even better for when I buy it. Well, you got to think that um, whenever it's going to be released, they're going to have to ramp up production. Yeah. So, you know, an ex it's not going to be, you know, an extra 30 days of, of getting it ready. They they have to get the production and get them shipped and, you know, make sure that everything is ready. I've been thinking about that, too. And, you know, because we saw the hardware and we've heard that it, it was, if it wasn't final hardware, it was pretty close back in September. So I also feel like the longer it takes for it to come out, the better the chance they can make enough for Canada. You know, oh, they're just uh, running those factories. <laughs> I, I think they're just toying with Canada. <laughs> it's going to come out every country but Canada. That's what. <laughs> yep, you're so close, but so far away. Yeah, it's because of the province of Quebec's legislation that all of Canada has denied a, an Apple yeah. Watch. Quebec! <laughs> no, I actually, I think it's smart for them to have such a long lead time, because, especially when you consider the fact that the Apple Watch is going to require different retail environments. Um, they're going to need some time to set that up, and they don't necessarily want to give away the farm before they've announced an official release date. So being able to actually have the time to be like, all right, let's retrofit. God, how many Apple stores are there now? <laughs> Almost a thousand? Like, let, let's retrofit a couple hundred Apple stores in the next 30 days. That's going to take some time. We're going to take another quick break, and we are going to tell you about Chipolo. What's Chipolo? Chipolo Chipolo is a tracker for your keys, your bag, your anything basically that you can clip to a, to a keychain. Um, it's this little tiny flat uh, half dollar sized gadget uh, that beeps um, if you can't find it. Um, it can also ring your phone if you shake it. Um, it's pretty cool. Yeah, we saw it at CES and the one that we saw was almost like a little blue chip. Yeah, it's as I said, it's like a little, little fun, little half dollar. Um, yeah, I thought I had I had one sitting here, but um, yeah, they're uh, they're very they're very small, they're very light. Um, about the the 
Only thing I don't like about them is that they're not quite waterproof, but I don't really think any other tracker is either. But uh, I had great success having the Chipolo on my keychain. I tested it for about a month after we came back from uh, from CES. It's very cool. Yeah, I think there's a review up if anyone wants to go look for it. That's true. Yes. Uh, it comes in nine fun colors. Like Ren said, you can shake them uh, to find them. It was expertly designed. It's loud enough that you can actually hear it, and it has replaceable batteries. And if the battery, and which is you know different than a lot of other models because if the batteries expire, you just replace them and you keep on going. If you want to find out more, you can go to chipolo.net. That's www.chipolo, C-H-I-P-O-L-O.net. I don't know if it's actually pronounced Chipolo, but it's so much fun to say. Chipolo, Chipolo, I don't know. It's uh, They're like, fun, though. Chipolo! Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So check it out. Like Ren said, you if you have a problem with losing things, this is the ultimate digital forget-me-not for nerds. You'll be happy. Thanks, Chipolo. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I, I could talk Apple Watch all day, but I want to try and get a couple extra things in here. The Yosemite public seed uh, was updated this week, and now everyone has access, well, not everyone, everyone on the public beta has access to the new Photos app. Have you played around with it at all, Jim? I have. I played around with it a little. Um, you know, I'm not a, a huge photographer, uh, and so for me, Photos is, is probably you know, a great app because I just want to be able to go in and say, oh, that's kind of dark and, you know, lighten it up a bit. And, you know, if Enhance uh, doesn't usually do what I needed to do, then I'm lost. You know? <laughs> if you, you can't want... take that, that that glass of Heineken that you took at the Chieftain and make it look spectacular, that's all. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> yeah. <done. laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and really, let's face it. I mean, I, I take pictures of, of, uh, of beer. So... <laughs> Uh, it's hard to screw those pictures up. Yeah. Jim has one faces folder. It's called Heineken and Madison. <laughs> I wonder if Apple or uh, if Photos will recognize Heineken beer bottles. So <laughs> you have your FAQ out, Serenity, and you were also talking about whether people should go in all in on Photos during the beta stage. Yeah, I'm I'm still of the opinion that all in is probably a mistake if you do not have a backup somewhere. Uh, but I will say um, I've I've been using 10.10.3 10, um, on two of my three machines right now, and it's fairly stable as a beta operating system releases go. And again, being able to publicly test it is a, a pretty good sign of confidence on Apple's part that it's not going to horribly break your computer. Uh, but you know, you still want to you still want to make a backup. You still want to have a backup of your photos. Uh, but I but I would say if you are truly like itching to get your hands on the photos uh, photos for Mac. This is a a good entry point for I think the uh, the techies who want to play around. For your mom, maybe wait until you know ten ten three actually hits. Uh, we also had uh, Ben Beharin, um, noted analyst and uh, writer at Tech Pinions, did a, an article for us this week about the Max market share. Now he's incredibly enthusiastic about it because it's been growing even as the PC industry as a whole has been shrinking, and he believes there's a lot of factors from the durability of Apple hardware to the halo effect from things like the iPhone, especially now that it has features like continuity. Uh, and he thinks, Jim, that within five years, it could get to double digit, if not, you know, 15 to 20 percent market share. I wouldn't be surprised with the way that it's going. I mean, I, you know, when, what was it, maybe five years ago, uh, when the netbook was huge, and, you know, the PC market went all in on the netbook and people were, were wondering when Apple was going to release their version of the netbook. And I wrote a story at that point and said that they never will. And, you know, luckily for me, I was right. But with the way that Apple is selling computers now, you know, five million a quarter. And I remember when I first started reporting on Apple, they were selling 600,000 a quarter. You know, and that was a big quarter. When Apple had a profit of a million dollars, I mean, the company was doing a happy dance. Now they have a profit of, you know, 18 billion. So it's it's quite a difference in the way that, that Apple is uh, making products and the way that the products are received. So I, I don't see a slowdown in the Mac industry. I see a slowdown in the PC industry overall, but the quality of the products out there seems to resonate with the 
uh, the consumers. Yeah, I agree with you, Jim. Uh, and I do think actually netbooks is kind of a contributing factor towards the PC industry's uh, slow and untimely death. Uh, because Apple is, you know, Apple's always focused on making good products, but they've also focused on making sure that the margins are acceptable for those products. Yeah. Um, and that they're not going to build something shoddy that that they're losing money on just for the sake of having a cheap product. And I think that's served them very well um, in an industry where uh, the rest of their competition is is not so interested in that, especially when you factor in the iPad as a potential uh, part of the PC market, um, which I really do think it is based on, you know, the majority of people who buy iPads. Um, that is an even bigger opportunity for growth, where it's, again, like the iPad may not be doing such gangbuster sales um, as the iPhone, but it's still doing pretty, you know, it's still solid. It's still growing. There are new people buying it, not people upgrading to the newest model, which says that the the general market is growing, even if people are not necessarily upgrading. And in yeah. fact, I actually feel like that bodes well for Apple because it means that people are still hanging on to the iPads that they bought two, three, four years ago, which means, like the Mac, it has a long upgrade cycle. Well, and, and I ask people, you know, going back to the same thing, when they say that the iPad market is failing and the iPad is a disaster, and well, how many tablets did HP sell last quarter? Yeah. Yep. Or, Microsoft. Or, well, do you yeah. remember that, Jim? Mike, uh, Apple announced, I forget how many millions of, I, of uh, iPads sold, and the headline was uh, disappointing. And then Microsoft announced, I think, one tenth or one one hundredth of that many surfaces sold. And people are like, surfaces are gangbusters. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's no bias in media. No. <laughs> no. It's, uh, it's, my mom actually did uh, an article. For, she previously did an article on the iPhone 5C and one-on-one -on -one training. And this last week, she did one on her experience with the iPad. Because, you know, uh, Federico Vitici did his how he uses his iPad, and my mom's like, that's really different than how I use mine. <laughs> <laughs> so she ended up writing it up, and it, it, it's very different than how I use my iPad. For her, it's become her personal television, her personal newspaper, her personal book. It's just the way that she mostly like she reads, that she and, and she likes the fact that it's not just not just to consume that content, but she can look for things, she can Google them, she can take pictures, she can use water logs, she can paint. She can do all these things on this screen that's really easy for her to, to take with her and syncs with her phone so all her stuff is always up to date. And, and I think that's the compelling story. And what I found most interesting, and I don't think she included this, is that she originally got, we gave her an iPad 2 uh, for her birthday when they first came out. And we just gave her an iPad Air as an upgrade. And we thought she'd stop using the iPad 2, but no, she now switches when one's battery goes down. <laughs> because I forget, like normal people, like, it, the <laughs> iPad lasts so long, people don't ch charge it every night. So once in a while, three days later, noontime, it starts, she'll just swap them out, and use the other iPad. And she notices a little bit of difference, but for her, it's high availability iPads. Yeah. Yeah, and that's great. And I, I still use my iPad mini and my iPad uh, Air 2. I use the both of them and an iPhone 6 Plus and my Mac. You know, so... And the question always is, you know, are you going to use the new iPad or this new product, whatever it is, or a new service? And I really can't. I can't. If something's going to come into my workflow, something else has to go out. So if Apple releases, you know, a new computer, a different size screen or, you know, a different size screen iPad, I really don't have room for it until something leaves. Yeah. So, or... You know, that new product doesn't get in. Jim Sofa is like Survivor, Survivor Island. <laughs> You're voted off, new contestant arrives. <laughs> yeah. It's a special land. All right, so I don't want to keep us too long because we did, we did two shows last week, but I do sort of, Jim, is there any, any apps or any accessories? I know you were at NAMM. Anything that particularly caught your eye lately? Hmm. Yes, there's uh, some new uh, software music software from a company called Universal Audio. My, my favorite company for music plugins, they're, they're a high-end company, but their plugins are, are reasonably priced and they have some new guitar amp sims and, and things like that that they just, they announced at NAMM and released yesterday. So that was very cool. So this afternoon, when you can't reach me, I will be in playing guitar. <laughs> I'll be hearing you. Good thing. <laughs> 
<laughs> There's no, no, no continent can separate that level of, of sound. How about you, Ren? I know you're still planning on your gamer's guide. Yeah, I'm working on an Alto Adventures gamer's guide. I, I finally got all of the unlocked characters um, after spending way too much time on the game. Uh, but it's it's that good, so I'm happy to write about that. And also, I've been testing... Hold on, I'm going to... I'm going to go rescue it from out of frame. You scared her off, Jim. I know. See? I have been testing uh, a Fugu speaker, which we saw at CES, which is a water waterproof, drop-proof uh, Bluetooth speaker that allows you to, like, switch cases on and off. So, the, like, there's a... There's a uh, waterproof internal core and then wow. you can swap it out with like this is the sport model and then there's then they have one that is uh, a fancy clutch model apparently this is this is the one that you like put on your countertop next to next to your fancy microwave um, and then they also have one that looks like it belongs on the backpack of an army man uh, that has like big giant rugged otter box like uh, drop protection uh, but they're they're really loud speakers and I actually I was testing mine in the snow today it's so, supposedly snowproof so I just threw it in a snowbank while I was cleaning off my car and it worked wonders so I'm, I'm enjoying it so far um, it's it's cool it's it's very very different than uh, the typical little Bluetooth speakers that I've been testing Nice. Cool. And I'll just give a shout out before we go to uh, Vesper, which was updated. Friends of the show, John Gruber, Dave Wiskus, and Brent Simmons. And the interesting thing about it is they tried going cheap. Now they're going for a full you know, productivity price point. It's on sale right now until they sober up. Eventually it'll be $10. And I, I want more apps by people who make these boutique apps. I don't, I don't, I'm happy that Brent Simmons is at Omni because he'll do great stuff, but I wish Brent Simmons would make enough money off of Vesper that he could choose to do other work and wouldn't have to do other work. Right. And, uh, yeah. You know, it's the same reason I subscribe to the Loop. Uh, I, I want to support all these awesome. There's a Loop app, uh, Loop Magazine app on the App Store. You can get it. I, I want to support all these amazing things because I want more of them. And if I don't pay for them now, I will not get more of them. I won't even have the option of paying for them in the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No, thank you for making it. And I'm really happy that Apple's been promoting apps. You know, pay once, play always. Um, I think that's terrific. Yeah. So, Jim, if people are looking for more of your fine work, where can they go besides the Chieftain? Uh, uh, prison. <laughs> local. Uh, uh, they can, uh, I'm at uh, loopinsight.com or jdalrymple on Twitter. Awesome. What about you, Ren? At Saturn on all of the social things and on imore.com. Uh, and if Ali were here, you could find her at iMuggle. If uh, Peter were here, you could find him at Flarg. You can find me at Renee Ritchie, and you can find all of us at iMore. Serenity and I and Jim will all be at the event on Monday. It'll be lots of awesome Apple news for everybody. And then we will get you some form of podcast. I'm not sure what day or when or what time, but we will get you something. Something will follow that event. We should do it at the Chieftain. Yeah. <laughs> Live roundtable. Yep. All you'll hear is clinking and Jim laughing, but it'll be the best podcast ever. And then falling. <laughs> <laughs> so once again, the event is Monday. starts at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. We'll be covering it. Jim will be covering it. Uh, join as many of us as you possibly can. I want to thank everybody for watching live. If you missed the show live, you can find it at youtube.com slash imorevideo, or you can find that at iTunes under the iMore Show. And I want to once again thank lynda.com for sponsoring the show. For a free 10-day trial, visit lynda.com slash imore. That's l-y-n-d-a dot com slash imore. Thanks, Linda. Thank you so much, Linda.